Thank you so much, everybody, for being here for my session on why resilience has become a cybersecurity superpower. I'm Lisa Young. I'll be your host for this talk today. And I was invited here because of my role as an ISC Squared board member. I serve on the board of directors for ISC Squared. And I also work for a company. I'm vice president of cyber risk engineering for a company called Axio. But I want to make sure that you know is that the opinions in this presentation are my own, neither those of my employer or ISC Squared. So thank you again for being here. Okay. So hold on a second. Let's get the controls right. All right, everybody. So this is me. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. I just want you to know that I am a risk, a quantitative risk, data-driven problem solver. And I believe that cyber risk management is a team sport. So everything that I talk about today is going to be how do we make our team stronger? How do we build our muscle? How do we make sure that you know we bring uh, fresh ideas and fresh talent to the cybersecurity workforce and to our talent pool? Uh, the slides for this presentation will be available. And what that means is that I've put in some links and some other things, some uh, search quotes and some things on this slide. I've put in my LinkedIn email. And the purpose there is for you to get in touch with me. I do interact a lot with the community. And I want to make sure that if you, if there's something that I've said that's not clear or you want to know something about, please, by all means, reach out to me. All right. Well, let me start first with a couple of definitions. And I believe this is important because cyber, the word cyber, um, is an adjective, right? And so it modifies the word the word that, you know, follows it. And it, it gives more specific information about the thing you're talking about. So cybersecurity, cyber crime, cyber risk, cyber resilience, cyber threat. So we use the word cyber a lot. But what I want to put it in the context of is of or relating to computers, information technology, any kind of digital communications. And risk, just as a term, means exposure to danger, harm, or loss. Risk may or may not materialize. And when you put those two things together, typically cyber as the modifier in front of risk means that it's unauthorized access or unauthorized use or there's some other nefarious element. So I just want to set that up. But the reason I start there is because cyber is, I always like to enrich the definition of cyber to cyber physical. And the reason I do this is that uh, cyber physical and digital, because we live in a digital world, even though digital meaning non-tangible is connected to our physical world. So this notion of cyber physical, okay, is very important uh, from a building your cyber muscles, building your superpower in risk management, building your resilience superpowers. And I put a little reminder on the bottom of this slide. Everything that is in our digital world today is based on the OSI model. So the OSI model is the Open, Center, open Systems Interconnection model, and it's the basis for all digital communication. I'm not going to talk about it in this presentation, but if you want to think about anything related to digital, digital communications, our connectivity, cyber physical, it really is about the OSI model. And it's the basis for all digital communication, whether that communication is authorized or not. Okay. And this slide just sort of builds it out further and makes it more real, right? So when we think about hardware, software, the, con the connectivity between hardware and software, our smartphones, our smart home, our manufacturing, healthcare, transportation, our cars, right? I mean, our cars talking to one another, our cars talking to toll booths, our cars talking to, um, you know, this notion of cyber physical systems in our digital world. Sometimes you hear the terms IoT, Internet of Things. Sometimes you hear, you um, electronic control units, printed control boards, all of those things are about the cyber physical world. And there's a lot of untapped both con uh, connectivity and complexity in what we do today. So one thing I'll mention is that if you have any questions, by all means, put them in the chat window. Um, I'm going to try to remind you as we go through this presentation that as you think of things, or you just want something answered, please do put them in the chat window. So uh, 
my personal sort of sense here is that, you know, I'd like to set the context for cyber risk. And I'd like us to think about cyber, physical, digital world and take an ecosystem view. Okay. Uh, that notion of conditions and consequences. And I'll talk more about that. And I really do believe that all roads lead to risks, but I don't believe everything is a risk. Okay. So I realize this is a little bit of a busy picture. So I'm going to spend a little time on it because I think it really is the basis for moving from a sort of a mental model of cyber as a technology problem or cyber as a limited scope problem and expanding the view to risk management and then getting to the con the, the resilience sort of, uh, of mindset. So starting from the, from the left, let's talk about services and products. Every organization, whether it's public, private, government, military, for-profit, non-profit, whatever kind of organization that you find yourself operating in, it delivers a service or product, meaning it exists to serve some mission or deliver a service or deliver a product. And within the context of that business or that enterprise or that organization, again, for money, for non-profit, doesn't make any difference. You do activities. Now in this slide, I've labeled those productive activities or business processes. Some organizations call them projects, some call them functions, some call them initiatives. There's a lot of different words to be used to describe the things that we do to deliver the services and products to our constituents, our customers. And those products and services use assets, right? So in this diagram, the things in the middle are the people assets, people as an asset, people to deliver the service or product, people's brains to think it up, information assets, technology assets, facility assets, that that's where the service or product is performed or delivered or transported or stored, supply chain, uh, third-party risk management. Supply chain could be partners who help you do part of the service or product delivery, or they could be the supply chain. They could be the raw materials that you use in the delivery of your product. And the examples on the bottom right, but all of those productive activities, business processes and functions use assets for the purpose of delivering the organizational mission. And what we do as security professionals is we do a lot of the activities that are in the bottom right. And I call those in this diagram, I call them risk management processes, okay? You could call them cyber risk management processes. You could call them what they are, application security you know, uh, access management, identity and access management, all kinds, third-party risk management. A lot of the activities that we do in this domain are designed to keep the assets in their intended state so that they can continue to deliver the, the, the products and services, okay? Now, uh, risk management, okay, risk management. So thinking about moving from a controls-based sort of management of risk to uh, uncertainty-based or a forward-looking view of risk. Every time you hear the word risk, you should think about uncertainty. And risk management is the ongoing process of adopting some kind of a holistic approach. And the reason why I'm so keen on moving from cyber to cyber risk, to risk, to resilience is because we do need to take a more holistic and multidisciplinary approach to solve some of our problems. The reason why the theme this year is resilience is because it is an all-encompassing all sort of mental model about how do we get to a place of being able to keep our knees bent and make sure that we're proactive Okay, so this notion of establishing a repeatable process to minimize and mitigate loss is the definition of risk management. Now, drilling down a little bit, this notion of risk assessment is often the shortcut term that we use. We call everything a risk assessment, a, a risk and control self-assessment, a, a risk assessment, a gap assessment, a compliance assessment, a risk, you know, we use the term risk assessment a lot. But let me just ask you to, back up and say um, risk identification, I think is equally as important as risk assessment, okay? And risk assessment is usually comprised of the functions of identify, analyze, and manage. So 
Risk assessment is often a term that we use to mean risk identification, risk analysis, or you know, risk management, risk uh, response, risk treatment. What I wanna say here is I believe that risk identification is one of the most important sort of superpowers that you can develop that you may not be actively doing today. You may be doing a risk and control self-assessment or a control self-assessment, but what I'm gonna say is risk identification is about looking at the conditions. Um, the tips and tricks for doing some of these techniques are in the boxes on the bottom right of this slide. So for identification, you might look at a that RCSA as a risk and control self-assessment. You may also do interviews. You may also ask people what they're concerned about. You may also do some brainstorming or uh, tabletop exercises to identify what people are concerned. These are the conditions that people are concerned about. Conditions are things like threats, vulnerabilities, areas of weakness, insider threat might be a condition. And a lot of times we spend time on uh, understanding what is the probability of some threat materializing, or what we might also want to take a look at is how susceptible are we? How susceptible are we in our organizations to some weakness? Okay, so there's that uncertainty factor. And then the other side of the equation for risk identification and assessment is this notion of consequence or impact. And consequence or impact is what the organization would feel, what would happen. And I'm gonna go through some specific examples here. I just wanna set the stage that if you're not doing a thorough risk identification before you do some analysis, um, you, might be, uh, you might learn some things. Okay, so this notion of uh, the risk ecosystem, I do believe we should take an ecosystem view because many things in our environments and our external environments are connected, right? Uh, so the risk ecosystem, I'm gonna talk, start at the top left here on the vulnerability management process. And generally speaking, and I am generalizing because I know there's a broad and wide audience for this talk, but generally it's around day-to-day -day patching, release management, issue management, problem management, you know, there's a lot of different things it's called, but it's about making sure it's an input to the risk management process. It is a process on its own and you do need to manage your vulnerability process well. However, it also should feed the risk or issue management process. Same thing with threat hunting. When you think of threat hunting, threat modeling, if you're a cyber threat intel analyst, you know, many of those things, many of the activities that you do are inputs to the risk analysis or the risk management process, right? And understanding the specific threats are more valuable if you have a process for getting the information to the people who can actually do something about it, right? So, so it's not sufficient just to threat, just to hunt for threats unless there's an intake process by which those can be prioritized, sorted, compared against other risks and threats in the environment, other vulnerabilities to which you might be susceptible, and then decide a prioritized course of action because we know that we can't fix everything all the time. And then on the bottom right, we've got this notion of controls management, right? So putting all of these things in the context so they can be prioritized. It's not just finding a gap or finding a vulnerability or finding a threat and then doing going straight to the action. It's actually using some kind of criteria, whether that's risk appetite or risk tolerance, or using some kind of risk taxonomy to make sure that you've um, done a thorough and complete identification of all the things that you're susceptible to. Uh, and looking at these things in the context of the business and mission and also there's this notion of which of these things are in our control, meaning which of these we can plan, do, check, act, and take some action on, and which of them are outside our, of our control, and how can we be more, build our preparedness muscles, right, to make sure that we can, um, we can do something about them should they materialize as an incident or a realized risk, okay? So again, I'm going to ask you if you have any questions about what I've just said to please do put this in the chat window. I know this is a lot to throw at you and it's a lot of moving parts, um, not just only focused. So we've set the stage now 
for risk being about uncertainty. That's why this notion of looking forward, emerging things, things on the horizon are all part of the risk equation, okay? As our threat intel, as our vulnerability management, as our other things that we know. Now, we have a more complete picture of the ecosystem. I'd like to move to the topic of resilience, okay? And moving from risk to resilience is about building your capabilities and your muscle. But let me start first by describing what resilience is and what it might mean and some analogies to help you think about this. So resilience is an emergent property. And what that means is you don't buy resilience. Now, let me just stop here for a second, and, and uh, I'm going to come to this in the next slide, but I just want to say this here because we haven't gotten to it yet, and you can't see my slides yet. In the business continuity and disaster recovery world, the word resilience is often a synonym or a substitute or a, you know, a synonym for business continuity or disaster recovery. When I say resilience, I mean much more of a, a pre preparatory as well as after something has happened. So I mean more like a slinky. So this little diagram in the beginning, in the middle of my picture here is a slinky. And normally I have a slinky on my desk uh, to help me with risk, but today I don't. I do have a magic eight ball, but I don't have a slinky today. But what the slinky reminds me is that we need to be flexible and be resilient. So I don't mean resilience in the business continuity disaster recovery. I'll say more about that in a minute, but resilience is a property. And we take our definition. I take my definition from the physical sciences world, right? It's about ebbing and flowing, bouncing back. And it's about when you think about building your resilience muscles, right? So building a resilience capability, it's about what I said before, understanding the connection from the business strategy, objectives, what I want to accomplish, who I want to serve, what are the risks that could keep me from doing that, keep me from meeting my strategy, keep me from meeting my objectives. And then how do I adapt? Because sometimes the risks that are realized or the incidents that occur are uneven. They're not either or, they're not binary. There's different situations, changing conditions, different kinds of disruptions. And so this notion of being resilient means that you can be like a slinky and be a little more adaptable, right? And so what are some other ways? The analogy that I like to use for resilience is health, okay? You don't go to the store and buy a bottle of health. You become healthy, health emerges when you eat well, sleep well, take care of yourself, exercise, get regular checkups. In the cyber world or the risk world, the cyber risk world, moving from risk to resilience means you plan for something. You can't plan for everything, so you have to be adaptable. You make sure you check and you don't just check once a year or once a quarter or once every so often. You plan, you check, you do, you act in a repeat, wash, rinse, repeat over and over, right? So you understand your connection between your mission and your services and the critical assets. You understand, uh, you know, you've identified your critical suppliers. You do a robust job of identifying all the risks that your type of organization might be subject to and things that you haven't even thought of. You do some scenario analysis and planning. You do coordinated management of things. So maybe your vulnerability management is coordinated with your incident response. So for example, you do some root cause analysis on your incidents and you look at all the root causes of the incidents that have occurred over a period of time and you say, which of those indicate that we need a better vulnerability management process, a quicker vulnerability management process. And I'm using that because it's a very concrete example, but many of the root causes of incidents are caused from vulnerabilities that have a solution. Right. So where do we want to put our resources instead of looking at threats? And I think threats are important, but where do we want to put our next dollar? Is it to shore up something that continues to happen over and over? Um, you want to make sure that your management and deployment of people 
is robust and that you're putting them on the highest priority problems based on risk, right? That's a resilient superpower. Um, also management of external partners. You know, do you have really robust and good criteria for understanding the value uh, that the partner or a particular product provides in the ultimate delivery of your mission, okay? Okay, so as I said before, the traditional, the, the, uh, the traditional business continuity and disaster recovery is a very important part of resilience, but it's not all of resilience. What I'm talking about is operational and organizational resilience. It's really about that um, multidisciplinary approach where you prepare. Well, let me, let me back up. Before you prepare, you anticipate. Anticipation is done through the notion of, um, uh, the anticipation is done through good, robust risk identification. What scenarios would impact us and how? Then you prepare for those, knowing that you can't prepare for everything. Then you adapt if something happens or changes, and then you withstand, recover, and get back to business as usual as much as possible, okay? So in this diagram, which you've seen before on the bottom, I changed those risk management processes to resilience management. It's like a continuum. The better you get at risk management, the more re resilience muscle you actually, um, you actually build. Okay, so now that I've got that out of the way, I'm gonna give you an example of the resilience ecosystem landscape. This is from a top down view rather than a left to right. So on the top are threats, exposures, events, conditions. In the middle are your products and services and assets. On the bottom of your business are resilience processes, okay? And in this particular example, you see in the lighter colored box, uh, the cyber attack in this case renders the technology and information assets unavailable. You may not know the reason why. Maybe it's ransomware. In this case, it might be terrorism or crime might be the motive, but you don't know that yet. But all of a sudden, you need to take a holistic approach for your business continuity, disaster recovery, knowledge and information management, situational awareness, incident management. So your resilience processes have to be unified, okay? Uh, all right, so I'm gonna say any questions? I know that was a lot, but any questions here? So let's talk about building a resilient superpower capability, okay? So when faced with many of these dynamic challenges, the most successful cybersecurity programs engage a diverse and holistic approach. So, you know, there's a clear lack of diversity in its forms within the cybersecurity profession, both racial, gender, thought leadership, all kinds of reasons. But we need to engage multidisciplinary teams. And earlier this year, ISC Squared formed its first global uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion task force to support that, to advance meaningful progress in this space. So let's talk about why that's really important. Who are cybersecurity professionals today? Well, they're largely millennials, which means they're between mid-20s to mid-40s, and 72% of them are male, okay? So in the United States, now remember, uh, uh, there are several research papers that ISC Squared has done in this space. In the United States, and it is a little bit US-centric, although we're expanding our research globally, Cyber uh, racial diversity is, is closer to parity than gender diversity, okay? And this is a big deal because this notion of inclusion, we need to make sure that we include different uh, thoughts, different viewpoints, different, um, you know, just really a multicultural and also multidisciplinary approach, okay? So it's not just gender and racial, but it's also education. In the US, in, in most occupations, about half of the workforce is female. But in the, uh, in the US, only one in four computer occupations in, are held by women, and only one in five of those in cyber are held by women. Um, so let's talk about the gap in cybersecurity as a workforce. 
globally, it's 3.12 million people that we should and could and can hire as we grow to build our muscles in risk and resilience. Um, you know, Asia Pacific probably has the largest uh, gap. Okay. But in the United States, and I'm sorry, in North America, we have uh, nearly 400,000 um, open, unfilled roles. Okay. So let's talk about um, let's talk about the top 10 technical hero skills. And then I'm going to give you some additional superpowers that have nothing or little to do with technology. So uh, first one, cloud security. You know, we know a lot about, you know, cloud is a hot topic right now because people are looking for concentrated expertise. Many of you may have heard the saying a few years back from Wendy Nather on uh, the cyber poverty line, organizations that are smaller or don't have resources to do some of the things that I've described to build their superpower, their resilience muscle might want to look at cloud. Okay. Some others are data analysis, right? Malware analysis, coding and programming. These are all still important skills. Uh, intrusion detection, access management, administration, control design. Okay. One of the underserved markets, I think, is risk analysis, risk assessment, risk management, risk identification. And that's the number one sort of both on the technical list and the non-technical list that people say is needed in this field. And risk management, cyber risk especially, requires a multidisciplinary approach. But let's talk about the non-technical superpowers, right? The What I call the secret resilience superpowers. Okay, so analytical thinking, critical thinking, problem solving, uh, you know, this notion of creativity, these are all things that it takes to solve these thorny problems that we have, okay? Uh, the ideal model, uh, this is a, a graphic about how to solve problems. There actually really is an ideal model, I-D-E-A-L, if you look it up. Uh, identify the problem, define the problem, explore the problem, action the problem. They use look back in this graphic. I actually prefer learn. I think we should fail fast learn something and move on to the next thing, okay? And then, um, you know, ability to work on a team. This is not a solo, this is a team sport. There's one more to this list that I'll add. And for those, especially in the millennial or younger cohort, and that is sleep. You need to make sure that you get plenty of sleep as an emergent property of taking care of your health to be more resilient. Okay. So tips for recruiting and retaining diverse teams. Consider upskilling or reskilling staff that works in your organization. Hire for attitude and aptitude. I personally believe that security principles and engineering principles and a lot of these skills can be taught if you hire people that want to be on the team, right? Uh, invest in training. Make sure that people understand um, assign a buddy or a mentor, and I'll cover a few of these in depth, but, you know, professionals are more successful if they have a mentor or, or people they can talk with about problems in the space, right? Um, a uh, you know, recognition uh, builds confidence. When I said fail fast, what I mean is give somebody a hypothesis, give a team a challenge problem. I mean, we do this when we have offsites. Uh, you know, one of the ones, my son is also when he was in robotics and in school in elementary and middle school, they have challenges. You know, the spaghetti marshmallow challenge where you have to build a tall structure using only spaghetti, uncooked spaghetti and, and marshmallows and maybe some scotch tape. You know, let's start small and tackle some of the big problems um, by learning how to fail quickly, fail fast, and learn from that using the ideal model, and then keep on going, right? Okay. Professional development. Um, you know, professional development isn't just training and certifications, and I know that seems odd from a person who sits on the ISC squared board. I believe in certifications. I have my own and I maintain them and I pay out of my own pocket every year to maintain them and get the continuing education that's needed because I believe that it's important to continue to develop yourself. But one of the strategies that employers could use is to entice people with professional 
development, right? Make sure you're addressing their needs. Make sure you don't keep them in a role if they want to do something else that you rotate people around so that you can create a, a different lens that people are looking through and looking at when they're facing these challenges, right? Okay, next one is, okay, stop waiting for unicorns. I know, I know, but wait, I gotta show you this because this is my favorite right here. I happen to like unicorns. However, I will say to you, stop looking for unicorns. Hire for attitude, hire for aptitude. Um, you know, many, uh, there are many myths in cybersecurity. One of those is that you have to have a four-year degree. That is a myth, okay? It's just not true. Um, and, but often it's a barrier to entry, okay? Some of the job descriptions, you know, are not realistic. Uh, you need to look past sort of titles and hire for attitude and hire for aptitude. Broaden the net. Look for people who are in other fields teachers, veterans who are transitioning to the civilian community, liberal arts grads. There's so many other communities that could bring something to the traditionally millennial, you know, male dominated field. Also, if, you know, many qualified recruits have digital experience. And the reason I say this is think about electronic music or digital music. You know, many of the people in, in many of the creative arts now are using digital tools and digital software, and they have a lot of skills that could also be used in this field, right? Okay, add creativity to recruiting. Uh, yes, by all means, go after recent grads, go after people, but look at people who are consultants or contractors. You know, I like the gig economy because I like sort of being able to purchase and buy. I've also worked in the gig economy and I like being able to have the flexibility, the schedule flexibility. So if someone's a consultant or a contractor and doesn't want to work full time, it doesn't mean you can't use their skills, right? Other departments within your organization, other companies in the same industry, um, same skills, different industry, right? Hardware, security vendors and career changers. You know, many uh, people, especially over the last year, have taken stock in their own careers, their own lives, and decided they wanna do something differently. So give them a chance. If they have the right attitude and the right aptitude and they're willing to learn, invest in them, right? And if 2020 has shown us anything, it's that the talent pool can virtually work from anywhere. Right. There are some jobs that do require in person, but this widens the net for you. You no longer have to look in your backyard. Uh, you can actually look broader than that. All right. So I'm at my last slide uh, next to the last slide, which is, you know, let's talk about what you could do next week, next month and in three months. If you have critical open positions in your organization, can you collaborate with the hiring manager, especially if you know a little bit about the job, especially if you know a little bit about, um, you know, uh, what the requirements are that may not be obvious from reading the job description, put the word out on social media, put the word out to people who you want to work with, who are in your network, volunteer to be a mentor to a new person in cybersecurity if they're not from a traditional cybersecurity background, and also seek out a mentor yourself. You know, I have three mentees at the moment, but I also get mentoring myself, even at this stage of my career, because I think it's so important to continuously bring a new and fresh perspective to cyber. Next month, maybe you could offer to test your speaking skills by arranging a lunch and learn uh, in discussing or collaborating or start a book club, you know, and read some of the old sort of, uh, um, what do we call them? The classics of cybersecurity, right? And take an inventory of your own skills and, and look where you might add some new ones. And then in three months, you could research, enroll perhaps in a certificate or a technical program or some just take some classes that will broaden your own perspective, especially if you've been in the field of cybersecurity for a really long time. Okay, 
So I know you've asked questions along the way, and I appreciate that. And you can ask some more questions now, should you wish to. My LinkedIn profile is here. There are other links in this presentation that are um, ways to reach out to me, to contact me. And I'd like to say thank you for your attention and thank you for your time. And I hope I've convinced you that building your muscles in uh, risk and resilience is the way to, to, to um, develop superpowers. So thank you very much.